Let's start with the most beautiful and encouraging song entitled, God on the Mountain. He's promised that he will never leave or forsake us. No matter how good our lives are, no matter how rough it gets for us, let's remember his promise. Life is easy when you're up on the mountain and you've got peace of mind like you've never known. But then things change and you're down in the valley. Don't lose faith, child. You are never alone. For the God on the mountain is still God in all come so easy when life's at its best it's down in the valley of trials and temptation that's when faith is really put to the test for the God on the mountain still God in the valley when things go wrong he'll make them right and the God of the good times is still God in the bad times the God of the day is still God in the Welcome to this week's edition of the Senior Adult Sunday School Class of Corinth Baptist Church in Singleton, Mississippi. The title of today's lesson is The Redeemer Reveals His Glory. Today, we're starting a four-part journey through the book of Revelation that leads us to the end of the Bible and to the return of Christ. We begin with the revelation of Jesus' glory at, that opens the book of Revelation. And that's a, a vision of Jesus, the Son of God, who has all authority over time, death, and, and hell. I just found it awe-inspiring that John was able to give us such a detailed description of the person of Jesus at the beginning of the book of Revelation. Just look at this image of him as John describes him being behind him. It represents so much about him as he is right now. He's crowned Jesus of the Apocalypse. Our contemporary Christ, he is ascended, exalted, glorified, transformed, transfigured, transistent, transcendent, cosmic, and our eternal king. Our savior, excellent and awe-inspiring in his splendor, 
is present among his people. And he's offering us through his spirit, hope and confidence, no matter how many challenges we have to face in our mission for the kingdom. He lives and those of us who place our faith and trust in him will be with him forever. Now, this set of lessons are grouped under a general heading of Jesus will come again. And our scripture will be coming, of course, out of the first chapter of the book of Revelation. The first section of our lesson today is entitled, Jesus Reveals Himself in Glory. It's taken from Revelation chapter 1, verses 9 through 16. And it's, this is John writing, I, John, your brother and partner in the affliction, kingdom, and endurance that are in Jesus, was on the island called Patmos because of God's word and the testimony about Jesus. I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day, and I heard a loud voice behind me like a trumpet saying, Write on a scroll what you see, and send it to the seven churches, Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. I turned to see whose voice it was that spoke to me. When I turned, I saw seven golden lampstands, and among the lampstands was one like the Son of Man, dressed in a robe with a golden sash wrapped around his chest. His hair on his head was white as wool, white as snow, and his eyes like a fiery flame. <clears throat> his feet were like fine bronze as it is fired in a furnace, and his voice like the sound of cascading waters. He had seven stars in his right hand, and a sharp double-edged sword came from his mouth, and his face was shining like the sun at full strength. That's a powerful description of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ as he is now in glory. I can't think of another place where a description like this of Jesus comes even close. And we're going to talk about um, well, not types and shadows. Um, symbolism. It's the book of Revelation is full of it. Okay. And we're going to take some of it apart as we go here. But the book of Revelation is the revelation of Jesus Christ. It ties the entire Bible together. The symbolism and all of the um, uh, apocalyptic imagery of John's vision leave most people scratching their heads and wondering what it all means. But those wonders will be discussed in upcoming chapters. So come back next week. We'll probably be on this again. What we can be assured of for the moment is knowing this is the only book, the only book of the entire Bible that offers a blessing to those that read it and a warning to those who would dare to try to change what's said in it. Let me assure you, this vision of John is the inspired word of God. The fact alone, that fact alone, should be all we need to entice us into reading and studying the whole Bible, but most especially the book of Revelation. Revelation is a vision of the future, but 
more importantly, it's a vision of Jesus Christ. It's about who he is in his glory, what he has done to bring salvation and what he will do when he returns. That's why it begins the revelation of Jesus Christ, not the revelation of the end times. The focus begins and remains on Jesus. The Apostle John points out at the beginning of this passage that he was a part of God's people with us and that he, like Jesus and many of us, have faced brutal persecution for our faith. Just today, I read an article online that blared 3,462 Nigerian Christians hacked to death by jihadists in 200 days. Folks in Nigeria that are Christians, they have it rough. So no, coming to Christ isn't all about the shout. It's not all about the good feelings and it's not all about the love. God will test our faith with trials. Let me say that again. God will test our faith with trials. If you're a Christian, it's most likely coming. He'll try us in order to help us to grow spiritually. But it'll be worth it all when he comes for his church, his bride. The next section of our lesson today is entitled, Jesus reveals his authority over time, death, and hell. It's Revelation chapter 1, 2 verses, 17 and 18. When I saw him, I fell at his feet like a dead man. He laid his right hand on me and said, Don't be afraid. I am the first and the last and the living one. I was dead, but look, I'm alive forever and ever. And behold, I have the keys of death and hell, or death and Hades. Now in these verses, John continues to reveal this encounter that he's having with that glorified Jesus. Okay, our Savior, the one that we're going to see just like John saw. Our Bibles tell us in the sixth chapter of Isaiah that Isaiah was undone when he saw a vision of God in the temple. Undone, I'm assuming, means that none of his muscles worked and that he collapsed before the Lord. I've heard several preachers talk about being in the presence of God where they were laid out on the floor and they couldn't move anything but their eyes. No pain, just undone. I've come to believe that this is exactly what happened when Paul was blinded and forced to the ground in the presence of the glory of Jesus on his trip to Damascus. This business of falling at his feet as a dead man wasn't something new for John. I believe he had experienced this once before already. In the first verses of the Gospel of Matthew, it's described how Jesus had taken John, the Revelator, Peter, and James up on a mountain where Jesus was transfigured and stood in the company of Isaiah and Moses. In verses 5 through 7, it says, While he was still speaking, suddenly a bright cloud covered them, and a voice from the cloud said, this is my beloved son. I take delight in him. Listen to him. When the disciples heard it, they fell face down and were terrified. 
Then Jesus came up and touched, touched them and said, Get up, don't be afraid. How God loves us. In all of his majesty, the transcendent God of the universe leans forward to touch this frail and trembling human at his feet, encouraging him to rise and not to be afraid. This is a picture of the lovingly beautiful and gentle act of authority of our Savior. This great I Am declares himself to John as he bids him to rise. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He is the same God, the same Jesus, that spoke to Moses from the burning bush. You remember, he said he was the I am when Moses asked what his name was. Here, he tells John the same thing. I am the first and the last. Since Jesus is revealing to John that he is the the first and the last. He's declaring that he has all authority over even time itself. Yes, but not only time, death and hell will fall before our conquering king. Jesus is the living one. He is the living one who has gone through death and come out on the other side with all the authority given to him. And our Savior, Jesus Christ, has defeated both of them. Now, for all of us who are in Christ, our end of life is also just the beginning of a new chapter where Jesus, not death, has the last word. I'm glad for that. Just as Jesus reached down touching John, he was flat on his face as if he were dead. He has also raised us up into life. Let me go back over that last sentence. Just as Jesus reached down touching John, who was flat on his face as if he were dead, he's also raised us up into life. Our eternity has already begun. Oh sure, we're still alive and we're still alive all along. But now, for those who have been born again, an eternity with the Lord Jesus is already here. Our bodies will probably die, that is, unless he returns for us before then. But just as Jesus lives forevermore, so shall we. Hallelujah and praise God. Yes, I'm fiddling with my computer. I've got to make it stop doing what it's doing. All right. Now look, when we truly get our minds wrapped around the fact that we're totally unworthy due to our sinful nature, to stand in the presence of the majesty, the holiness of our Lord Jesus. And we humble ourselves in heartfelt, sorrowful repentance before him. That's when he reaches down, touches us, and tells us not to be afraid and to stand up. Look, why do you suppose Jesus' cousin, John the Baptist, why do you suppose Jesus told him that it was necessary for John to baptize him? He said it was to fulfill all righteousness. John the Baptist baptized unto repentance. Jesus had nothing to repent of. And being baptized by John unto repentance he was showing us of our need to repent. 
he was also showing us of our need for obedience. But it doesn't stop there. What happened as soon as he was baptized, the Holy Spirit came and rested on him. Three years later, on the day of Pentecost, Peter preached to the astonished crowds in Jerusalem as recorded in Acts 2.38, Repent, each of you, and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So Jesus was demonstrating what goes on at salvation. Repentance, obedience, and the infilling of his spirit. We believe, we repent, we obey, and in his mercy and his love, he reaches down and he touches us. He covers us. He fills us. For all intents and purposes, he lays his hand on us, telling us not to be afraid and to get up. I don't want to preach, I'm trying to teach. <laughs> Let section three of our lesson today. It's entitled, Jesus Reveals His Present um, Presence Among His Churches. Now, it's coming out of the first chapter of Revelation, verses 19 and 20. Therefore, write what you have seen, what is, and what will take place after this. The mystery of the seven stars you saw in my right hand and of the seven golden lampstands is this. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. Let us please not let it go unnoticed that in this vision John noted that Jesus was standing among the lampstands, the churches. Okay, the significance of where John saw him standing is revealed in the scriptures just as I read. The, lap, the lampstands represent the churches. And let us, Jesus not only sits on his throne in glory, he's also present with his people right here on the earth and has been since the day of Pentecost, 2,000 years ago. Here, let me read a portion of a paragraph that was in our Sunday School lesson for this week. We are known to him, and he is known to us. No matter what the circumstances may be, Jesus knows his people, and he's devoted to caring for us. The darkness of the world, the oppressive powers and the principalities that manifest themselves in governments that seek to thwart the spread of the gospel, the sins and transgressions that continue to batter our hearts as we pursue holiness, the suffering of tragedies that threaten to overtake us, all of these are no match for the glorious King who stands amid the lampstands and who cares for the churches. There is indeed many strange images presented to us in Revelation. Many of them aren't so easy to understand, but in the case of the lampstands and the stars, John makes it clear what they are. The lampstands of the churches, the stars. John records his vision in the Greek language. The word that he used for angel could represent both angels and messengers. Surely, as born again children of God, the, the messengers, be they angels or people, but rather, Oh, I messed that up. Let me go back. I want to read this this time. Surely as born-again Christians of God, 
Our focus should not be on the messengers, be they angels or people, but rather on the message itself. One that says that he sends the message. Boy, I messed those notes up pretty bad. All right, well, let's move on. Whether the gospel is spread by men or angels, it's by the power of God that it is spread, okay? The revelation of Jesus Christ is a book that's absolutely saturated with sevens. Now, interpreters of the word consider the number seven to be the number of perfection. In speaking to the seven churches, they feel like because seven churches were mentioned, it's actually referring to all the churches of the world. The significance of the churches being represented as lampstands in John's vision isn't hard to see at all. Matthew chapter 5, Jesus told us that we are the light of the world and that we are to let our good works shine before others so people will give glory to the Father in heaven. But let me break that down just a little bit further. We, the church, spread the gospel, which is the light, the revelation of God and of what he's done for us and for what he wants to do for every person who hears it. But it's not just about proclaiming the truth. It's also about us demonstrating by our lives we live the proof of the message that we bring. When people hear the truth of the gospel and they see it in action from the people who are, are sharing it, they're drawn to Jesus, to the lampstands, which are the churches. We've got to live our lives upright before the Lord so that the world can see it. I've got a dog barking. Okay, going on. Our job is to shine his light in the world, not ours. The good works that we do are that shining light that God has powered. And the good works that we do are things that God prepared for us to do before he ever created the world, I believe. Our job is to proclaim his kingdom. But it's his power in the form of the Holy Spirit that dwells within us that empowers us. He, uh, his light in this world produces a couple of reactions, all right? There are those who love darkness because their deeds are evil and they just don't want them exposed. For others, seeing the light and how it's affected those who have freely chosen to embrace it, they're drawn to it. I want to close by reading one more paragraph from our lesson. When he gave us the Great Commission, Jesus told us that he is with us always to the end of the age. The same God who was with us in the Garden of Eden, who became God with us in the manger in Bethlehem, and the God and who is God for us by going to the cross to win the victory over death and sin. This is the same God who stands among the lampstands ensuring that the light of the gospel will not go out. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we love you. We praise you. We look at you 
as high and lifted up, far above us. And yet, we know that your very Spirit dwells within our hearts. I am so glad to be alive right now, Lord. Not because of the horrors that I'm seeing around the world, but because of how you're working to bring all of the prophecies to coalesce around a, a point in time where you will take your church from this world and let the Antichrist step forward. Help us, Lord, to view whatever news that comes to us through spiritual eyes that we might see how you are working, not just in our lives, not just in our communities or in our local churches, but in this entire world. Peace treaties are being signed in Israel. Your prophecy talks about how Israel will be so prosperous, how oh, they'll be talking peace and safety when calamity strikes. And from all that I've learned of your word, we won't be here. We'll be at your side where the bride is supposed to be. I want every person on the earth to come to a saving knowledge of you, Lord, to be baptized with your spirit, filled with your love, overflowing to the point that we can love one another. But that's not the way of this world. So come, Lord. I don't want to put you off one second. Help us, Lord, to walk in your light. Help us, Lord, to learn every day more about you and about your will for us. And I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you so much for watching. The new COVID has broke out. It was predicted. They're going back to telling us wear masks and get the jab. I just wonder if you've been vaccinated two times and you come down with COVID, does that mean the vaccine doesn't work? And if a mask can stop bacteria, but because viruses are so much smaller, they pass right through these masks. So if the masks don't work and the shots don't work, what are they doing? Well, read Revelation. Read the old prophets. Much will be revealed that the news is not going to tell us because those secular people have no idea what that Bible says. Pray for your brothers and sisters who are being tormented and killed. And pray for us all of your neighbors that this sickness will pass us by whatever it is well that's it for this week's episode I'll try to have another one out by this time next week until then bye bye for now There's a place